Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Fresen. This week, we look at the slow strangulation of a classic New England fisherman and New York's last standing mushroom farmer at the hands of overzealous regulators. In the second half of our show, we'll speak with Karen Moreau, president, CEO, and co-founder of the Foundation for Land and Liberty. Up first, we're pleased to welcome career professional fisherman David Gaithel, board member at the Center for Sustainable Fisheries. David, welcome to the show. It's nice to be here. Hope I can uh, explain to your audience what I do. <laughs> Dave, you started working on a commercial fishing vessel at the age of 13 and paid for your college biology degree with your earnings as a captain or crew on various New England ships. Working in the North Atlantic is a tough life and is certainly not a way to get rich. What attracted you to the sea? Well, it's a tough life, but it's extremely rewarding. You are your own boss. Once you leave shore, essentially, it's it's no different than it's been for thousands of years. I wow. mean, the equipment has changed, the you know the vessels have changed, but there's a freedom on the sea that you just don't find on land. You go where you want to go, and you you follow your nose. Yes, you kind of have to have good what I call sea sense, or we call it the fishy gene, <laughs> the ability to detect something that you can't see that you can only infer its existence, and you have learned that over really a lifetime and and how to infer where fish are going to be on a certain day at a certain time. Tell us about your boat, the Ellen Diane. You, you fish out of Hampton, New Hampshire? That's correct. I have a 44-foot stern trawler uh, named the Ellen Diane after my wife. We drag a net across the bottom, and we use the mesh size in the net to uh, catch various kinds of fish at, at various times of the year. So the, the net is, the best way I can explain this to, to people who don't know, is kind of like a, an, a funnel turned sideways. And the narrow end of the funnel, the spout, is pinched off at the end. That's called the caught end. Mm -hmm. And that's where the fish collect. And the wide end of the funnel, the top has floats on it to keep it open, and the bottom has what's called a sweep, which can be made of chain or rubber or uh, rock hoppers, and that determines what kind of ocean bottom you can fish on. So you're primarily in local territorial waters, not out in the deep sea. That's correct. We're what's called a day boat. We leave every day at about between 4 and 5 in the morning, and we come in sometime between 2 and 6 in the afternoon and unload our catch. Now, you fish for cod, flounder, and other so-called ground fish. What's the current state of these wild fish populations? Are, are they endangered species? Well, you know, that's one of the problems that we're having is there's a huge disconnect at the moment between what people like myself are seeing on the water and what the government scientists are telling the government and, by extension, the American public is out there. Hmm. The fishing now is probably not the best I've ever seen, but it is certainly a lot better than it was in the uh, late 1980s through the late 1990s. It's, it's pretty good. Your industry is a textbook example of what economists call the tragedy of the commons. No one owns the fish that swim in the sea, so every fisherman has an economic incentive to catch as much as he can, despite the fact that if everyone does that, fisheries will collapse. Take us back through the history of trying to manage national fish stocks. When did the government first get involved in regulating commercial catches, and, and how has that evolved over the years? Well, to some degree, the government has been involved since there's been a government. Way back in the 1800s, they paid what was called a cod bounty, hmm. where you went to the customs house and turned in receipts for the number of cod you caught, and they paid they paid you for it. They, they paid you instead of the other way around. So they were stimulating fishing. Yes. Well, it was to keep uh, a fishing fleet available so that they could be commandeered in times of war. Oh. And that lasted up through around the Civil War, and then the government kind of stepped back and in the early 1960s, uh, they began kind of what's called the modern era of fisheries management. The government started doing stock assessments, which are you know, biological sampling to determine, mm -hmm. try to determine how many fish are in the sea. And they still didn't have any real regulatory scheme. They belonged to something called ICMAF, which is the International Commission for Northwest Atlantic Fisheries, and that set minimum mesh sizes and some seasons and closed areas and stuff. But overall, it's pretty toothless. Hmm. In the late 1960s, we had had 
increases in technology that allowed for very large vessels to be built. The Europeans had already pretty well cleaned out their waters, and so they started sending what were called distant water fleets to other continents to Hmm. fish. And when I was a teenager, I fished next to boats here less than 15 miles off New Hampshire from pretty much all the countries of Europe, you know, including the eastern countries. Now, the eastern countries were here to do more than catch fish. I mean, they used the fishing platforms to spy on the military bases in my area, among other things. But they were expected to come home with a boatload of fish, and they did. And they basically strip-mined the waters here in New England in the late 60s and early 70s. That must have been a disaster for fish stocks. It was. But the thing about the Europeans was they came and they left. They come, they take a huge amount of fish, and they'd leave. And, you know, it was a six-month trip. Hmm. And and then the fish stocks had kind of come back and, and filter back in. But anyway, the the fishermen got pretty upset to the point where they staged protests in Washington and, and, and other cities, blockading harbors and stuff, telling Congress, you have to do something. On the other side of the coin in this debate were the U.S. Navy and the State Department, which wanted freedom of the seas because they were afraid that a so-called 200-mile limit would cause them problems in Mm -hmm. parts of the world where they currently had free passage for the Navy. Congress passed what was called the Magnuson-Stevens Conservation and Management Act, the so-called 200-mile limit, uh, in the mid-1970s. And the trade-off there was foreign vessels would be removed from within 200 miles of the United States shore, but in return, the U.S. fishermen would accept so-called modern fisheries management, which meant... The government now had not only its nose squarely into the tent, but the entire camel. You know, in the op-ed you wrote for the Wall Street Journal where I discover you, you you indicated that your annual cod quota dropped from 60,000 pounds to 3,700 pounds, which you caught in four days. Do we have too many commercial fishermen chasing too few fish? We did in the 80s and and the 90s. We've tried a number of management actions. I mean, a a major action in New England is called an amendment, and a minor one is a framework. And I think we've had 18 amendments and 53 mm. frameworks in the history of Magnuson, which is about 40 years. So they've tried a number of things, and among those have been to limit the number of boats, then to reduce the number of boats, then to reduce the seasons, the areas fished, increase the mesh size, protect spawning fish, uh, an assortment of measures. As I said, we had too many boats Mm -hmm. catching too few fish. We solved that problem. We went from 1,800 boats when we limited entry down to probably less than 100 that are now deriving their income from ground fish from North Carolina to Maine. You know, if you think about long-term trends, I believe fish farming has just passed conventional fishing in terms of total tonnage supply to global markets. Commercial ranching largely displaced hunting for for much the same reasons, leaving the wild game to recreational hunters. What's the best way to make commercial fishing sustainable? Well, I think you you match the number of boats to the number of fish, but you do it in more general terms than we're trying to do it right now. Right now, we have what's called single species management, which means we manage each individual fish like it swims in a vacuum out there, when, Hmm. of course... We know that they all interact with each other. Basically, we're saying we want to have both the foxes and the rabbits at maximum sustainable yield (laughs) at the same time. And any armchair ecologist could tell you that's impossible. When the foxes are up, the rabbits are down and vice versa. And so we have a lot of what I would call foregone yield, which is means that we're leaving uh, we're taking a very small fraction of some species that we could be taking much higher volume of to rebuild other species that aren't rebuilding despite the fact that we're taking very few of them. Don't the regulators employ scientists that can explain this to them? Well, again, the regulators employ a number of scientists, but they don't always listen to everybody. (laughs) That's the kindest way to put it. There's quite a lot of background noise out there in the scientific community. There is no one right answer for fisheries management. There's a lot of ways to get to where you want to be, but everybody thinks they have the right answer. The people that I think are listened to the least, unfortunately, are the people who are actually out there all the time, and that's the fishermen. David, you recently sued the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration over a new rule that forces fishermen to pay for inspectors that ride along with you to not only monitor your catch, but 
sounds like, spy on every aspect of your operation. Why isn't dockside inspection good enough? That's correct. I am part of a group who are suing the government. The actual lawsuit is filed by a public advocacy group out of Washington called Cause of Action. The reason we're suing the government is they are trying to tell the fishermen that they are going to have to pay for these for-profit outside companies to come in and send these monitors on the boat, which are currently being paid for by the government. And they are telling us that we have to sign contracts with these companies and pay them $710 a day to take a monitor on 25% of our trips. And we have no say in the contract in terms of, you know, what we have to pay for. Uh, we have no say in these uh, outside companies' profits. Uh, we don't even know what they are. You know, how much of the $710 mm. a day is profit? Is it $500? Is it $50? We don't know. And there's a larger issue at stake here, and that is who who pays to monitor a public resource. In other words, you have meat inspection in this country. Farmers don't pay to have your sirloin stamped USDA approved. The Food and Drug Administration decides what pharmaceuticals can enter the marketplace. Big pharmacy doesn't pay for the Food and Drug Administration. You fly on airplanes and the TSA inspects you and your baggage. The airlines don't pay for the TSA. The government has decided these are things to do that it feels are in the public interest of its citizens. Now, my feeling is if the government feels that this monitoring is that important and it's willing to pay these exorbitant rates to these for-profit companies, as a taxpayer, I'm not happy. But as a fisherman, that's the government's business. Let's come back around to those broader issues. I'm still trying to understand what it is these monitors monitor. You can weigh your fish when you get to the shore. What else are they going to be observing and recording? Well, the monitors take biological samples. They monitor what's called the discards. We have the rules for fishing off New England are incredibly complex. There are some fish you can't keep at all. There are some fish that have minimum size limits on them. There are some fish that have poundage limits. It's, it's, it's very complicated. So these people ride along, and, and basically I liken it to you go to work in the morning and you drive on the interstate highway to get to your work. It would be like having your own private state trooper riding along in your car <laughs> beside you to make sure you don't go 66 miles an hour in a 65-mile-an-hour zone. That's basically what they do. Why can't they just stick a digital camera on board, snap a picture every five seconds, and throw it in a file? Well, they've tried that. As I said, we're very heavily monitored. We have what's called a vessel monitoring system, which sends a signal to a satellite 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have Coast Guard overflights. We have at-sea boardings, warrantless search by the Coast Guard. They just get on your boat and they can look anywhere they want huh. without, you know, having a warrant. We have uniformed NOAA fish cops. We have state fishing game deputized federal fish cops. There's plenty of monitoring already. I guess I know now why my fish costs $18 a pound when I go to the fish store. <laughs> yeah, but you're not, I mean, you're not, the $18 a pound is still not paying what the actual cost of these programs is. I would say right now in New England groundfish, the cost of the actual program probably exceeds the value of the fish. Wow. So, David, if the government prevails, what's the economic impact of requiring each vessel to pay for these onboard monitors? Well, as you mentioned earlier, I've had a 95% cut in my cod quota in the last four years, and that's mostly what we catch here off New Hampshire. Now, trying to make a business survive that had a 95% cut in revenues is hard <laughs> enough. It's nearly impossible. But to then add this charge of $710 a day, the government's own reports from its own economists say that 60% of the boats will become instantly non-viable. And that report also uh, acknowledges uh, short changes in its methodology where they didn't consider things such as the fact that we have to lease fish from inactive fishermen in order to fish and balance our fish books and stuff. So it's actually much higher than that. It's probably close to 90 to 95% of the boats would be rendered instantly non-viable. Is it Noah's goal to drive fishermen out of business in order to protect the fish? 
you'd have to ask no of that. I'm sure they'd say no, but uh, as you know, as somebody who's looking at this as the American public, you'd really have to ask the question: What is their goal? I mean, it. it I can't help but answer yes. You're going to put a charge on a vessel that guarantees that it can't possibly be a viable business, then that would appear to be your goal. Getting into the details of the law, what actual legislation grants NOAA the authority to impose these costs on the individual fishermen? Well, that's the interesting part of this. I'm not a lawyer, and you know I'm not going to pretend to play one on the radio, but <laughs> my understanding is that only Congress can tax people, and regulatory agencies can't. And this is basically a tax. And they've said to fishermen, sign these contracts and pay this money or you can't fish. Now, Noah turns around and says, oh, it's purely voluntary. Well, if somebody tells you you can't go make a living, I don't see how that's voluntary. So the basic, I think, thrust of the lawsuit is the fact that this is certainly taxation without representation. It's also... I don't know how you would want to describe it. I almost describe it as extortion or blackmail. You know, I mean, these are the kinds of things the mafia does. The mafia says, pay me a certain amount of money and your restaurant won't burn down. (laughs) This is sort of the same thing. Yeah, it's a nice boat you got there. (laughs) Yeah, this is a nice boat you got there. If you want to keep it, pay this money. What's the status of the litigation? The status of the litigation is it's pending. The first hearing will be held in Concord, New Hampshire, to seek an injunction to enjoin NOAA from imposing these taxes on the fishermen until the full case is heard by the court. Are you getting any broad support from the industry? I'm getting broad support from all over the country. I've actually been very pleasantly surprised. I mean, the industry is is squarely behind me, obviously. I'm fighting on behalf of Mm -hmm. the remaining fishermen in New England. But I've gotten support from a much broader range of people from across the country that have read the articles and have heard, you know, shows such as yours calling me and saying, you know, we just had no idea. This is wrong. How This can't be. I mean, that's the first response is this can't be true. You know, our government can't be doing this. But. I assure you it is true, and your government is doing it. <laughs> you know, often these programs start out with good intentions but take on a life of their own based more on bureaucratic initiatives than anything else. I, I understand that one of these for-profit corporations is led by a former NOAA official who designed the program? That's correct. There's three three companies in, in New England. There's other companies in other, other parts of the country as well. But, yes, a former... Regional administrator and former head of NOAA Fisheries back 15, roughly 15 years Mm -hmm. ago, is now the president of the largest of these for-profit observer companies. So, David, you're the second guest in in as many weeks who's mentioned cause of action. We just had a woman on recently where the Department of Labor is trying to shut down her consignment shopping business. Remind us who cause of action is and what they get involved with. Cause of Action is a a public advocacy group. They believe in government accountability, and their goal is to hold especially regulatory agencies uh, responsible for their actions. All regulatory agencies operate under some guiding law that is produced by Congress. And in those laws, there is, you know, very specific, Mm -hmm. the agency can do this, the agency cannot do this. And in fisheries, it's the Magnuson-Stevens Conservation and Management Act. And cause of action's contention is that nowhere in the act does it say that National Marine Fisheries Service, NOAA Fisheries, has the right or the ability to charge fishermen for these monitors. It gives one very small section to one specific region for cost recovery in North Pacific ground fish. And when Congress is that specific and it lists one particular region and excludes mm-hmm. the other seven, it's pretty plain reading the law to me that that is the only place that this can be done. David, you've been working the sea for a long time. It's a physically arduous and sometimes dangerous business. Just looking at your background, you're about the same age as me, not a spring chicken anymore. What are your plans if you lose this fight? Um, 
I'm kind of like an alcoholic, you know, it's one day at a time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I'll cross that bridge if I come to it. New England ground fishermen are exactly my age. I'm the average age now of a New England ground fisherman. I'm 62. Wow. New England has an actuarial problem with fishermen. We have no young people entering this business because they can't deal with the bureaucracy. They just can't handle it. Uh, it's too easy to get a job on land and not have to go through all this. So we're, we're dying out. And consequently, less and less of your fish is going to come from New England fishermen. The United States already imports 91% of its seafood. If you want to make that 100%, we can just keep moving in the direction we're going because we're well on our way. David, we wish you the best of luck. I love fish, so I hope you uh, I hope you prevail. Please keep in touch. Yes, I intend to to do this as long as I possibly can. I've I've enjoyed my life on the ocean. I get up every day and and look forward to going to work. Uh, that's you know in marked difference to most people. Thanks for being on the show. Okay, you're welcome. That was David Gaithel from the Center for Sustainable Fisheries here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Fresa. Real Clear Radio Hour is a not-for-profit, donor-supported program. To make sure you don't miss any of our shows or to catch up on our archive of over 200 interviews with leading thinkers and doers from around the world, stop by realclearradio.org and sign up for updates. If you'd like to hear more programs like this, please hit the Donate button or contact us to become a corporate supporter. And stop by RealClearMarkets.com, my go-to place with diverse views on political economics. Ahead, we'll speak with Karen Moreau, President, CEO, and Co-Founder of the Foundation for Land and Liberty, about how she's trying to save her family's mushroom farm, the last one standing in the state of New York. Stay tuned.